Hi everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today for the latest BFC Green Talk. Every week or so we get together for a 40 minute discussion and presentation where we share ideas, learn new skills and discover inspirational stories. All our previous talks can be accessed on the bfc.green website so you can share your own ideas whenever you want on the ISO Facebook page. Now, we are very lucky today to be joined by Lee Marwick, an educator based in New York, who will be telling us about her social gardening program aimed at inner city teenagers. Uh, Lee will be sharing insights into getting teenagers interested in food, running a successful gardening group, and using the program to promote community development. Lee is an alumna of the prestigious Teach for America program. It's also holds an MSc in teaching and an MPhil in education. Lee, thank you very much for being with us today. Please take us away whenever you're ready. Good morning. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Um, so let's start with thinking about the foods you think of when you think about New York City. You're probably thinking here pizza, maybe some bagels, or maybe even that deli on the corner. Big American food, big American calories, low nutritional value. So what happens when those are the only foods that are available? Um, what we call this in the United States is a food desert, which basically just means that a neighborhood has limited access to fresh foods, fruits, and vegetables. And the effect of this is typically bad eating habits, unhealthy communities, less family cooking time, which often means less time for families to spend together, and a really high cost of the foods that are available in these spaces and places. So the bottom line is limited access contributes to a limited consumption of healthy foods. So the school where I work is actually located in an area considered by some to be a food desert, Bushwick, Brooklyn. Uh, the community is low income. A lot of our families are on government food assistance. Um, but come from cultures really rich with food and, and food cultures, so the Caribbean, Mexico, and Central America, um, and the southern United States. And despite this, they have very little access to high-quality, affordable foods. Um, the school, which is this gray building here, has a community full of English language learners, um, about 30% of our students. 25% uh, of our students are considered to have special educational needs. So they either have some kind of learning disability or emotional disturbance. And we have low academic performance. So this means that on state exams, our students are scoring in the lower half. And many of them are about two years, some even further below where they're expected to be in, in reading and math. Um, and the teachers at our school saw this as a big problem. Kids aren't being exposed to nutritious foods, um, and their families are unwilling or possibly even unable in a lot of circumstances to spend money and time cooking and preparing food that their kids might not like, that might just get thrown away, that they might not be able to get anyway. So we decided that we needed to have a solution for this. And the way that we did that was by first starting a school garden that would give kids access to fresh food and cooking classes. So we took one side of our gray building and turned it into what you can see on the screen. Uh, we founded what was called a green team, which is a teacher and student-led team, where the kids actually built those flower beds that you could see, painted them, and planted all of the fruits and vegetables that we grow in our garden. Um, we've expanded to flowers and herbs and things as well now. 
And our, our biggest support in doing all of this the last two years has been Edible Schoolyards NYC. So in order to develop um, a strong curriculum for our students, we partnered with a grant with an outside organization which has been able to support us by providing two experts in cooking and gardening education um, that help to incorporate food education into science and math and English classes. Um, they've provided access to cooking supplies, including food, an additional refrigerator, tables, access to seeds and plants, and further outreach beyond our school. So going out into our local community, getting parents involved, um, getting more teachers from our school community involved, and also allowing us access to the food community in New York City. So chefs, food writers, ed, uh, food tech people, rather. And here's what we've seen from all of this outreach, all of these classes that we've provided. We've seen stronger parent engagement with our cooking classes. Um, our school site has somewhere between five and 12 parents per cooking class. Edible Schoolyards partners with a number of other schools where they've seen an even greater number of parents responding in surveys and calls and general commitment of time, which we haven't seen as much at our school, but parent engagement has certainly gone up in my facility as well. Relationship building between students and teachers has gone up. For many of our students who struggle in a classroom, they don't tend to have positive relationships with the adults in the building. But being able to engage in a hands-on activity has really helped them build strong, strong relationships with adults in the building. It's also increased their engagement in traditional classroom learning. When you are able to, for example, pull something out of a novel that you're reading and expose students to that in a real world way. For instance, a book that I was reading in my class had Southern cooking in it. So collard greens and cornbread and sweet tea, which many of my students had never heard of, had certainly never tried. And exposing them to these helped them make those connections as we were reading it and then beyond throughout the rest of the book. Um, and then they're also more willing to try new foods. And I think that for, for many of us, this seems like a really, really little thing. But when you have 12-year-olds who are completely unwilling to eat food that is given to them in the school building, they won't eat the free lunch they're given. Uh, the only thing we ever see them eat is prepackaged chips and candy bars. The fact that they're willing to try asparagus and kale is a really major victory because we know that the more times a child is exposed to a food, the more likely they are to select that food for themselves when it's provided as an option. So that means that when parents buy that food, the kids will eat it, that students will actually choose a salad at the salad bar for lunch for themselves in middle school, in high school, and beyond, starting them off with really good eating habits from a young age, and helping them to really build solid health for themselves for the rest of their lives. All right, we're gonna get a little bit more general here and talk about the design of this program, how we got it all rolling, and, and where we've gone from there. So our first major step was to create a team of people who were dedicated to this um, project. So teacher and staff buy-in was really, really important for us here. We then started providing classes for teachers in the school building so that they knew what we would be doing. Um, they were very hesitant initially, 
and didn't feel many of them as if they had enough knowledge to bring their classes downstairs and be useful. And so providing them with some prior training and setup so that they felt confident in what we were doing and what they could do was really, really important. And we started doing some family outreach. As we built this program, we found that it was really important to have a consistent student and teacher group um, that met either at lunches or after school or sometimes both. Uh, we've had about four or five dedicated teachers that have been part of the team since its inception, which has allowed constant improvement and progress to take place and a pretty solid group of kids. Now, many of them have changed around and left and come back to us, but we have constant student involvement, which is the only way that a program like this can work in a school building. Then we had to start implementing more and more classes for students. So in the beginning, this looked like getting as many teachers to come down as possible for uh, a one-off lesson that might have very, very little to do with what they were doing in the class, but it got them exposed, it got their students exposed, it helped us all understand what was going on. And then from there, design and integrate classes into the curriculum that teachers already had. So the math teacher in sixth and then again in seventh grade needs to teach students about ratios, Recipes is a really great way to do that. So instead of coming down for a lesson on adding, which they should know by age 11, bring them down and we will incorporate a really strong lesson every year about ratios into your classroom. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then finally, actually using our community for broader community involvement. So not only having parents come to us, but also have the kids leave the classroom and go out into the community. So this has looked like field trips to mentor sites, field trips to a couple of restaurants. We did um, a very cool ice cream making field trip recently with them, which certainly doesn't promote healthy eating as much, but allowed them to see their, the mint that they grew in the garden be taken from the mint plant to actual use in a professional kitchen. And finally, we've actually been able to mentor an elementary school in our district to help them set up their own school garden, um, which has gotten underway this year. All right, and now breaking it down into more transferable skills and components, both for students and, and kids and you all as business professionals and parents. Um, for our students, our big transferable skills here are making connections. So we've been able to see them make connections from math to the garden room and then bring them back to the English language and reading classrooms. Um, but also making connections between cultures, seeing how similar food in Puerto Rico is to food in the Dominican Republic to food in Mexico and how those cultures are similar and connected. We've seen huge improvements in teamwork, at which they can take with them from the classroom into their business, into the business world. They have to work together. If there's a group of six kids, they have to figure out how to make that single recipe. And we provide very little adult interference in that because they are so able to pick a leader and build those leadership transferable skills. Uh, another major thing is cooking and recipe reading. Our students are not going to go into college or move out of their parents' homes and only know how to make pasta. They have a skill that they can take and provide themselves with healthy foods that they will actually enjoy that will provide them with some, some nutrients as young adults. It's provided them with greater ability to focus in a classroom setting and focus in any setting where they're required to do multiple step tasks. 
And finally, it's also really increased emotional stability. We have kids who feel like they have a safe space and who feel successful in our school building, which allows them to walk into the building in the morning and not feel like they've entered a place where they fail, which makes them feel more powerful and stronger and stable. And then reaching out to the adults who are listening here, um, your, your transferable skills really are being able to reach out and work with schools to implement and support this programming. So schools love to have parents come in. They love to have parents call. And one of the major takeaways from this for me has been how much our parents have assisted and how much they get their students invested in these, these programs. Um, volunteering time, donating money, calling in even with suggestions has been very, very helpful for us and is something that you can do to implement this in your local schools or your children's schools. All right, thank you very much for listening. Um, what questions can I answer? Thank you very much, Lee. Uh, that was a great presentation, and you certainly raised some fascinating prospects. I'm uh, certain you have a lot of questions for you. Um, but before I open up the floor to questions, I was wondering if I could sneak in with one myself. <laughs> so you, you mentioned the prevalence of food deserts in New York and you know, how your social gardening program is kind of a response to this problem of a lack of healthy foods. So do you think that skill-based gardening programs could be used as a way to tackle food deserts in a broader sense? Um, like for instance, it, could a school sell its produce to local residents? Uh, absolutely. That's a really great question and something that a lot of us have been considering. Next year, we're actually in the planning stages of starting a farm stand in our neighborhood. Um, we're working with Edible Schoolyards and another grant foundation to help to supplement our garden a little bit. We do grow a lot of things, but not enough to produce enough food for a, a true neighborhood stop. Um, but absolutely, so we'll have students who apply and then run and are actually paid a stipend to run a farm stand in our neighborhood selling what we produce and some supplemental fruits and vegetables to our community, uh, which adds a layer of entrepreneurship to our students' transferable skill sheet and um, and also is a really great community outreach program that can help provide greater access to healthy foods in the future. Uh, that sounds wonderful. So you'll be combining the gardening group with entrepreneurship, with work experience, and also community development. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely fascinating. Um, thank you for, for that. Uh, does anyone have any questions for me? Don't forget to unmute your, mic your microphone if you do. <laughs> Hello, uh, Mariam Kostenbusch, uh, so speaking. Thank you very much. A fantastic presentation, really uh, very enjoyable. And uh, my questions I have uh, about, like, do you have a special focus on, for, for example, like you speak about healthy food? Do you have also special focus on vegan or vegetarian or just the principle like to invest time to grow your food and to eat it? Like it could be like meat and salad. How you deal with it? Uh, so questions like vegetarian and vegan movement and healthy food, yes. Or just the question you do social gardening, the topic. Are your students eating meat? And okay. what's, what's the discussion Yes, about it? Absolutely. So we um, definitely do all of the gardening things that we can do. We provide kids with the food that we grow in our classroom to the greatest extent possible. But all of the food that we cook in school is vegetarian, largely because it's more difficult 
to guarantee food safety with meat products. Um, so all of the food that we cook in our kitchen is vegetarian, which gives a lot of our students who have a lot of access to meat products at home more variety in the kinds of fruits and vegetables they're exposed to. Uh, and also an awareness that vegetarian and vegan food isn't just gross, because <laughs> we have a lot of kids that make that assumption. And when they discover that, in fact, it is not, they are very excited. Uh, it's fantastic. Thank you very much. And uh, my other question, what do you think, um, if your project is upscalable, though it's possible, for example, to do it also in Moldova, or in Switzerland, uh, just uh, can you imagine like you also present like curriculum and steps? Is it uh, maybe, what do you think? Because uh, we are now at the discussion on some platforms and they say green projects are not upscalable. You can scale all fast food, but <laughs> green project is something you have some complexity, yes, to make it commercial or upscalable, yes. Yeah. And for me, it's, it's my question is more of a question about sharing experience, learning. What do you think, or and also the, the additional question, what do you think how much time you need, or one year, two years to set it? Yes, if you start from zero, yes, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. I think generally I totally believe that a program like this could be bigger with sharing of resources. We are the, I want to say, sixth or seventh school working with edible schoolyards, and they grow their outreach every year. Now, that being said, it is um, a program that also exists in the San Francisco Bay Area in California, and I believe they also have outposts in Chicago. So we're the sixth or seventh school in New York City. So outside of the American context, I definitely think a program like this could exist. It does require, um, I would say, probably two years to get really, really strong footing. Uh, we were much more able to do big things this year than we were able to do them last year. And next year we have even more projects on our back burner. But in schools, I, I believe it takes a little bit longer because everything is so school year based. We do only have nine, maybe 10 months to get things done. Um, so I would say in a school context, two years definitely, maybe in a, in a social community organization. Um, a little bit less time, but definitely, definitely possible. I know there are a lot of um, resource sharing websites that exist, although I'm not 100% sure what that looks like for the green community. I'm, I'm sure that they're out there where a curriculum like this could be um, scaled up and shared. One of my colleagues is actually working to put together the, the curriculum that she created that incorporated um, our, our food initiatives with English language learning um, programming to put all of that online so that's available to teachers at large because she has the same opinion that it's important to be able to, to share the, the knowledge that we've accumulated with uh, the broader community of, of greenies out there. Uh, thank you very much. And of course, thank you. That was very interesting. Um, does anyone else have any questions for the? So you, you mentioned that uh, parents sometimes get involved. Um, I was wondering if you could explain more about the level of day-to-day -day engagement that you see from parents. Absolutely. So we send out at the beginning of every year a survey asking parents what kinds of foods they eat at home, what kinds of supports they might need at home, um, and from there try to provide them with both the parents and their kids with supplemental instructions. So if we know that kids are cooking and eating a lot with their parents, then we're more able to know that parents are 
you know, willing to come in and, and do more of that quite often. We also do ask them if they would be willing to come in and do cooking classes with us. We do do a parent cooking class about once a month, um, sometimes in the morning during the school day, sometimes in the afternoon, to try to capture different groups of parents that have different working needs. Um, we also do giveaways at the end of the year because we have difficulty getting parents to return our materials. And why exactly that is, we are unsure. Um, my personal opinion is that 12, 13, 14-year-olds are less invested in giving their parents the survey than a younger child might be. Um, but we also have a lot of parents who ask us for recipes. Their kids will come home talking about something incredible that they ate at school today and we'll send home a recipe with them. Which sometimes works out really well. We've gotten some pretty funny phone calls from parents who supplemented with a different ingredient and it did not turn out very well. Um, our biggest day-to-day -day parental interaction is with the sent home recipes. Um, but depending on the family, we've also done a number of food giveaways. So in November in the United States, we have Thanksgiving, which is a big food holiday. And we have given away the last two years um, full Thanksgiving packages. So all of the trimmings, everything but the turkey that you would need to make a Thanksgiving meal for our families who are in homeless shelters or living in other transitional facilities um, in order for them to have some normalcy on that day. And that, that's one of the parent outreach programs that I'm personally proudest of. Although it is less day-to-day, -day, it certainly has impacted a lot of, a lot of lives. Interesting. So a, a large potential for, for impact and day-to-day -day engagement through sending home recipes and then you bring your paint on a monthly basis for kicking crashes. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And do you find that um, the social gardening program uh, can actually be used as a tool to help improve the behaviour of students? I imagine that some students may be quite difficult who you're dealing with. Uh, do you find the program to be effective for them? We absolutely do. Um, in fact, it's been successful enough that this summer we were invited to do a pop-up restaurant with a, a local restaurateur in New York City who offered to support and donate time and money to the program if we would set up a restaurant with kids. So when the principal heard about this, she asked us to make it a socio-emotional development program. So effectively partnering five of our kids who have a lot of potential but have some behavioral difficulties with five kids who are wonderfully behaved and enthusiastic about school. And they're actually in the process now of designing a menu for a restaurant, designing table settings, designing timing, uh, learning about the way that a restaurant runs during a food shift, um, all in the hopes that their behavior and connections to the school community will grow through this, I think it's five week program. Um, so we definitely have both outside investors and our, our own school staff heavily invested in using the gardening and cooking programming to improve student behavior and, and social emotional development. Uh, that sounds uh, very interesting. Um, okay, so I think we have time maybe for one last question. If anyone wants to jump in, now's the chance. Um, well, maybe. Like be, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, um, I would like to thank uh, thank you very much for this great uh, presentation. It's really interesting was to hear that about such project about uh, social gardening. Uh, I was just yeah. uh, wondering if, um, you know, we live in this digital um, 
age when kids are very much exposed to um, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and, and so on. So I wonder if you use it also to promote this and like bring kids by using Facebook, Instagram, uh, make them um, more involved, you know, so by planting something, they can share it with their friends and uh, this way spread the this good, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, on one hand, it's distracting them from social um, <laughs> media, but on the other side, also um, using it, social media, for, for good course. We actually, we don't encourage the kids to use it all that much, and I think that's a great idea and certainly is something that we should do next year. Um, there are so many beautiful things, and they do take pictures of them, but because as you say, it can be distracting, our typical course of action is to suggest politely that they put their phones away. Um, but we, we do, as adults, promote our programming online, and we also try to bring in things that we've found on social media or YouTube to the kids. There's a really great grow food wrap video that some students in Harlem created uh, that we found on on YouTube that we played for our students and they absolutely loved. So there is a, a ton of space to use social media for for growth of our program and to increase student investment, absolutely. Uh, th thank you very much. And one last question, just really short. Is this uh, mostly in New York or you also have it, uh, I mean, do you have any um, network throughout the United States, like, I don't know, Pennsylvania, maybe uh, like South southern states, uh, I don't know, like uh, uh, western states, or it's just as as a first project in the in the U.S.? So my school is, the things that I do specifically are exclusively in New York, in the neighborhood in Brooklyn, but the program that we work with, Edible Schoolyards NYC, is specifically New York-based, but the broader Edible Schoolyards program was started in San Francisco. So New York is actually the second major uh, American city that has it. And I believe that they also have an outpost in Chicago, but but I would need to double check on that. So it definitely exists in other cities, but I, I couldn't speak beyond New York and uh, Oakland, California. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's great. And uh, as Marina was also saying, like to, get, to have it up, see it developed going upscale, you know, so not just within the United States, but also like in other countries. Because I think mm -hmm. we face the same problems in all countries, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, uh, state so it's it's everywhere and mm -hmm. um, so for on one side it's it's as I said we sort of have to compete with bad things that happening there like uh, yeah. in terms of food in terms of media and so on so it's I'm very glad that uh, by doing this you actually are putting the seeds not just in uh, for, for like uh, plants and vegetables to grow but also seeds of knowledge in the heads of uh, kids that can develop and become better persons in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Karen, for your question and uh, Lee for answering so well. Um, I'm afraid that that is all we have time for today. Um, now, if anyone has any more questions, then please get in contact with anyone on the BFC Green Team and we'll be sure to pass them on today and she will hopefully get back to you in true course. Um, I'd just like to thank everyone for participating today and especially to Lee for her wonderful presentation and answering all the questions so diligently. Um, this is actually the last BFC Green Talk before we take a summer break, but don't worry, we'll be back in August with another exciting lineup of fascinating speakers and topics. And you can always catch up on previous talks on the BFC Green website. So thanks again to everyone and I hope you all have a great summer.